page and then we will be ready to roll. I feel like you have to debate the question of sanctity. <laughs> yes. There we go. Um, wait. What okay. Did you want me to call everyone to order? Uh, I can. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll begin with the next session uh, because we are on time at the moment and uh, we'll keep things running along at a good clip because then that way um, I don't let Wayne down for running a tight ship. So uh, to introduce myself, my name is Adrian Stagg. I am the manager of open educational practices at the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba and I will be facilitating this session today. The panel session, we have uh, three of our panellists here. Unfortunately, Professor Helen Partridge is ill today and will be unable to attend. Uh, however, uh, we have got a few folk in the audience who I have primed to be able to uh, answer some questions as well, so we will call upon them in due time. The focus of today's panel is putting forward the idea that um, opening the doors to higher education is simply not enough. There was very early on in the open access movement the idea that if we simply placed Creative Commons licenses onto our learning materials and we released them to the world, then this would be transformative in and of itself. That somehow student learning would occur, greater learning for the world would occur, and there would be really a, a great transformation of higher education. As the conversation has matured over the last 15 years, we're now at a point where very obviously greater access to higher education in and of itself is not enough. Despite that, in Australia, we are faced with a situation where the federal government has great control over education, sets our targets for us, and then, of course, our ability to meet those targets does, in a great way, play towards how much funding we receive. One of those, and one of the most influential reports in 2008 being the Bradley Report, started to set targets for representation of Australians, especially regional, rural, remote and Indigenous Australians, and was picked up in further reports. This idea then that increasing representation at university in and of itself was a good thing. I think that this aligns very clearly with openness in that we are having a very similar discussion and in many cases the open movement is somewhat more mature in their discussion and further down the track than the government reports would suggest. Now joining us this morning we have three of our panellists so the first person that I would like to introduce is Dr David Porter the Chief Executive Officer of eCampus Ontario who is joining us from Canada and Rajiv is pointing to to his headshot here okay uh, would you like to say good morning uh, David good morning everyone uh, I bet it's a lot warmer there than it is in Toronto Canada um, okay you yeah, um, for those of you that didn't hear David was expressing that he thought that it would be much warmer here than it was in Canada uh, unfortunately David I don't think that that's a sure bet um, we arrived in rain this morning uh, now we also have uh, so in uh, his role um, David uh, uh, looks after the the sorry is the chief executive officer of eCampus Ontario. Now they have been doing some fantastic work over many years in openness. Um, and one of the most exciting projects that I had the opportunity to discuss with some of David's staff last year when I was in Toronto was an idea of actually funding student led projects within the university where students identified particular areas of the university that they would like to see improve challenges that they would like to meet and so being able to fund these students who are often geographically uh, distributed to work in online teams to present proposals to the university on how they might improve services and aspects of operations so you can see here that this openness this transparency between the university and the stakeholders is something very clear um, at eCampus now, we also have joining us uh, Janet Rangel from, uh, Dr. Janet Rangel from uh, the University of Papua New Guinea and um, Open College, sorry. And um, I was speaking with Janet just earlier around a range of the things that um, are going on at, the, uh, at uh, Papua New Guinea Open College. And it is very impressive to see the way in which they are using OER to diversify 
their their courseware. Um, also to look at ways in which this can open up the curriculum and ways in which it can be integrated um, across a huge range of courses. Um, I was very impressed as well to see that part of their strategy is picking strategic partnerships like the Commonwealth of Learning, like the OERU, the ICDE, and being able to leverage and also be an active partner in those networks. So I think that that is well and truly to be commended. And certainly last but not least, uh, joining us today uh, on his Down Under tour, uh, for those of you that may not have seen the video, we will circulate that later, um, is Dr. Rajiv Jangiani from uh, Kwantlen Polytechnic. Now, uh, Kwantlen is uh, known as, the, as, in Canada, the largest adopter, creator, and adapter of open textbooks, this is this correct? Yes. And also I think that it shows a great amount of leadership in that Rajiv's position is the special advisor on open education to the provost. So his role is across the entire university working at both strategic and operational levels. Um, and on top of that, um, Rajiv has a, a, very, um, a very enviable research output in the area of open pedagogy and uh, recently has also launched with, in conjunction with Robin DeRosa, the Open Pedagogy Notebook, which I would highly recommend that you check out because it has actual cases of implementation of open pedagogy that we can all learn from. Not a problem. Very well. So the way that this is going to run is, first of all, I'm going to invite each one of the speakers. They are going to be speaking for between four and five minutes. Part of my job is to play bad cop and make sure that um, that, that we stay on time. Um, we're going to open with, with um, Janet, then we'll move to Rajiv, and then we'll move to David. So I'll pass over to Janet. Um, and your response to the idea of uh, that opening, uh, opening up access alone is not enough. Thank you. Uh, good day to listeners throughout the world and th those of you in the room. Uh, I'm very privileged and honored to be in this uh, panel and also representing Papua New Guinea from a developing country context. Um, I think for, for us in our space, um, just providing uh, quality uh, package learning resources to be made available for our students is not is not enough. And I think in the higher education space, to be rethinking and imagining, rebooting our thinking around uh, innovation such as open educational resource is the way forward. Um, and also, I, I believe that um, by embracing some of the successful stories that are happening from context in, in the developed world, uh, is applicable. Uh, what is applicable, we can try to implement in our context where we can take the baby steps. Uh, while saying that, I mean, there's a whole lot of a uh, range of activities that we could focus on. And it begins with the notion of unlearning what we currently do and the challenges that we are faced in traditional universities, especially in dual mode universities where we have, we have to split between uh, trying to offer programs internally as, as well as externally. So I think the opportunity is immense. The opportunity to, to, to ride along with uh, experts in the area of open learning and learning from the practices that are emerging, such as what we are discussing now in this forum. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pass over to Rajiv. Sure. There we go. And um, for those of you who are joining us online, uh, Rajiv is just sharing his screen at the moment. So if you're able to uh, let him speak to that. Brilliant. Uh, well, thanks very much. And, and it's lovely to be on the panel and have a chance to multitask in this interesting way. Um, <laughs> but. Um, so as, as Adrian uh, mentioned, and, and as Janet has alluded to as well, I think it's been really interesting to see the open education movement widen its focus. Uh, I mentioned earlier during the meeting, uh, widening from an emphasis on, on resources uh, to really uh, a focus on practices. 
in particular open pedagogy. Some of you will know uh, 10 years ago, the Cape Town Open Education Declaration was a real milestone in the movement. Uh, and recently, uh, they had the Cape Town Plus 10 uh, uh, meeting in which open pedagogy was highlighted as one of the, the real sort of areas where we're going to focus and move forward uh, in the years to come. But I wanted to just sort of frame this by saying that open pedagogy is, is really infused with uh, elements of open licensing, uh, as well as elements of critical pedagogy. And if you bring those together, it's really an access-oriented commitment to student-driven education. But it's also the process of building architectures for learning and using tools that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons. Um, and so uh, I think in many ways, uh, in open education and open pedagogy, this often takes the form of what are known as renewable assignments. So if we're talking about very concrete things, instructors moving away from asking students to simply create uh, a, a learning object uh, that it will only be seen by them, and instead uh, do something like editing Wikipedia, um, writing an op-ed piece and submitting it to a local newspaper to share their, uh, to apply their knowledge in, uh, in a really applied social scientific context. Uh, in the context of OER, we have students right now annotating open textbooks. We have students curating content that go into open anthologies, updating content within uh, textbooks like charts, uh, graphs, year on year based on uh, new public data, um, contextualizing information. Uh, for example, uh, there are students at Brigham Young University who took uh, an open textbook uh, for business on project management, and they replaced the case studies from business with case studies for instructional design adapting that, and even authoring original content. Um, when I talk about all of this, I think it's nice to, it's easier almost to be able to contrast open pedagogy with what is not open pedagogy. And I love showing this image, so hopefully the people online can see this as well. This image is in the public domain, so this is image is OER itself. But it's an illustration from a French book from about 100 years ago that shows different scenarios for the future. This one depicts the classroom of the future or actually the classroom of the year 2000, so I guess the recent past. And I think it's very easy to laugh at this image because of the ideology that's baked into this, right? In terms of who is permitted to be the instructor, who's permitted to be the student, the kind of learning that's taking place, not active, not experiential, no peer review, no, no note-taking even. And of course, the graduate student teaching assistant doing the actual manual labor, in case you missed that. So, I think for many, in many ways, for me, open pedagogy is a real reaction to that. And it's a, it's a way of looking at open education in a way that doesn't just democratize knowledge, which OER is a wonderful tool to do, but also democratizing the, the, the aspect of knowledge creation by making that more equitable. Uh, so I think for me, uh, many areas to focus, one of which is to make sure that um, we do not, with the best of intentions, perpetrate more harm by, re by reserving the right to create and publish OER to those who are already privileged, to those who can forego compensation. Uh, simply adapting things from developed countries, for example, I think is not the way to go. Uh, and also approaching things critically, uh, being mindful that you know, using digital or le leveraging digital, digital solutions can be helpful, but it can also in many contexts reinforce uh, existing power uh, hierarchies, existing uh, inequities within the system. Um, and finally, I'll just finish up by saying that with open pedagogy, I think the, as much as we focus on access, there's an equal emphasis on agency. Um, so more agency for the faculty member to take advantage of the 5R permissions of OER, not just pay lip service to the fact that we can adapt and contextualize, but actually do that. More agency for students, uh, certainly in the context of their education, uh, but increasingly even in the forms of public scholarship that they may choose to perform. So I'll stop there, but I think that's uh, the Open Pedagogy Notebook, which Adrian mentioned. Uh, you can see a snapshot of the front page over there is a space where you can explore a lot of these sorts of examples of what, of what people are trying to experiment with. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Now, uh, we have, are we ready for David? Very well then. Okay, so David, we're going to pass the microphone over to you uh, for your time uh, speaking about why open, why open access in and of itself is not enough. Okay. Yes, David is still. Now, David, your microphone is still muted, just in case you're getting ready. Here we go.
Do you see my slide? Just bear with us for a moment, David. We're just adjusting the sound levels. Do you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can see your slides. They are being projected here. Great. So I'm just going to pick up where Rajiv left off. And that is the notion that we really have to support uh, professionals in the academy yeah. if we expect to move the open education movement forward. Uh, it's our view that innovative educators fuel the commons and they need recognition, support, and compensation. Um, one of the uh, things that we do here in Ontario is try to build out a collaborative community across our institutions. So everything we build is built at scale so that all institutions can participate. We have 45 institutions. Uh, almost 50,000 faculty members and close to a million students uh, in higher education in Ontario. What drives our thinking is the notion that social good plus human connections can build high value community resources. And so as a province, we've taken the perspective to build a series of community connectors that work for all of our faculty members and instructors in an equitable way. We've built out an open textbook library. We've built out an open publishing infrastructure for the province. We've supported a group of uh, faculty members, instructors, and librarians called Open Rangers. We've invested in open education fellows We've invested in open education training, and we build out connectors that allow our uh, team to continue their communication with our faculty and instructor uh, cohort uh, across time. Our open library uh, is, is, has been launched, as has our open publishing infrastructure for the whole province of Ontario, which is open to every instructor in the province, a common platform for everyone to use. It's based on press books, which uh, outputs to many different kinds of formats, and is the kind of uh, environment that we know libraries and librarians and teaching and learning centers on our campuses are very willing to support because they understand the uh, efficacy of working with simple tools that produce uh, products and uh, resources that instructors can use and customize to suit their students' needs. We've built a very big network to empower faculty, and every time we offer workshops you know, on a provincial basis or a regional basis, they're oversubscribed. We have a network of open rangers on every campus uh, across our province, and they are the go-to people who help assist their colleagues and peers. We've also invested in open education research fellows, and they come from various kinds of universities and colleges, different disciplines, everything from computer science to nursing uh, to librarianship to instructional development, to teacher education, to history. They are everywhere, and we intend to renew those people over time. Our newest uh, service is called Extend. It is a, a piece of work for uh, self-directed learning, openly licensed in English and in French for our instructors to self-instruct around six attributes of empowered education that we believe are important to move forward in a, a, an, an era of need for digital fluency, and in particular, digital fluency that understands open and open resources. And we have very interesting little pieces of work emerging everywhere, including uh, the open faculty patchbook by one of our staff, uh, to a newsletter called The Catch that kinds of updates everybody on a bi-weekly or monthly basis. And it's part of the whole infrastructure of community collaboration and support. We're very much into stoking the fire and the enthusiasm of faculty and instructors, and we think they are key to moving forward in the open realm. I'll stop there. 
Well, thank you very much, David. And as you can see across all three of our panelists today, um, I was trying very hard to, to keep up with all of the good ideas, the, the things that I wanted to tease out. And uh, my writing here is barely legible in trying to keep up with, with just the sheer volume. Um, some of the things that I wanted to, to take out of this was I noticed that all three people spoke about uh, really embracing existing successes, whether or not uh, Janet spoke very clearly about the, the need to embrace um, other people's practice, see what is successful, learn from the community in, in particular. And uh, I'm very keen to hear some more thoughts at some stage, Janet, around your idea of unlearning what we do. I think that that's a topic that we could have a panel on all by itself, I think. Uh, Rajiv, I, I noticed that throughout yours, there was also a very strong sense of, of being able to empower both students and faculty to essentially make sure that um, their agency is respected. And one of the terms that, that, I, um, that I'm glad that the way in which you position the agency is that I hear a lot of other people talk about um, giving people a voice or giving people agency and unfortunately when you speak about it in terms of giving people those you're inferring that they didn't have it to begin with so uh, one of the things that I think is, is a beautiful part of, of your use of language is the fact that you automatically assume that they've got it we just need to find avenues that that really celebrate that and David, uh, I'm always staggered. I've, I know that you and I have spoken about how many um, students, how many faculty, 50,000 faculty, 1 million students, 45 universities. When you think about that, every time I hear that, I get chills at the very thought about what it takes to actually create a cohesive educational experience. And I think that when we take a look at the range of things from your open ranges to your empowered educators, to your open faculty patch books, these are all ways that I think you're, you're, you're very thoughtfully bringing together the people who are doing this good work and getting their voices out. And they are standing up for their own practice rather than the institution simply saying, well, this is what we're doing. We're actually talking to the people. So out of all of those, I wanted to first of all open up the floor um, because despite the fact that I've got tons of questions here, that's not the purpose of today. Um, I'll be roving Mike, so I'll, I'll make my way around. And were there any thoughts, questions and the likes that, that you had for any of our panelists? And then we'll move online as well. So if you are one of our online participants, we are not going to forget you. We will involve you. And I've got Dave here ready to, to grab some of the questions. So who's going to kick us off? Well, good, Nerida. So just introduce yourself and which uh, institution you're with. Uh, hi, all. Well, my name's Nerida, and I'm from Queensland University of Technology in Queensland, Australia. Um, and just for the whole panel, I guess, I've got a question about the role that libraries can play uh, in supporting your open initiatives. And, and David, you perhaps highlighted some obvious areas where libraries might be operating um, in publishing uh, and in provision of services, but perhaps if any of you would like to comment uh, on that role that you see for libraries. Thanks. So who wanted to start us off with that one? Okay, Rosie. Yep, very good. Thanks for the question, Nerida. Um, I, I think it's certainly the case in North America, but I suspect far beyond that uh, libraries have emerged as a very natural home for open education initiatives for most campuses. Um, I think certainly the expertise and the relationships are there. There's a, an, the, it's the emphasis on uh, the provision of services for sure, the expertise in terms of copyright, fair dealing, those sorts of uh, aspects of life. But I think concrete things. One is um, the role concerning discoverability. So I think uh, librarians are doing really good work um, to do things like embedding the mark records for open textbook catalogs into the local collection. So it makes it easier for faculty to find it on campus without going to a different repository. Uh, creating lib guides, even subject specific lib guides to make it easier for faculty to identify a curated collection of high quality open textbooks, let's say within the disciplines. Uh, but beyond sort of discoverability of OER, there's also uh, many, many libraries that are working to, to create publishing infrastructures. So kind of what uh, eCampus Ontario just showcased at KPU, we've launched what we call Opus, the open publishing suite. So again, for faculty who want to create and adapt open uh, textbooks and other open educational resources, it's really a, a service that's provided uh, jointly from open education and uh, the library. Um, so I think 
Um, the lovely thing is we already have existing relationships between libraries and academic departments, whether it's liaison librarians, for example, playing a role in terms of helping with discoverability or, or, or building the publishing side. Uh, but I think uh, I would think, and I th certainly we've seen it, that libraries have played um, a leading role in most campuses. Uh, and sometimes this involves partnering with other stakeholders, uh, partnering with the teaching and learning commons, for example, to work with especially innovative faculty who are interested in open pedagogy projects, partnering with the bookstore to run print on demand services for open textbooks that are coming out of the publishing suite, for example. But uh, the expertise, I think, is, is right there. I think the potential of libraries, and I think digi digital libraries are, are the way forward in, in, in a space like Papua New Guinea uh, and in other developing countries. I think creating um, resource hubs through the library would be a, a better option to, to try out. And if it's already existing in some spaces, or if OERU, the OERU community can support um, uh, the resource um, resourcing of um, resource hubs where people can come together and learn from uh, in communities uh, in, in institutions. Yeah. And David, did you want to add anything to that one? No, I think uh, I think uh, the two speakers have covered it very well. Excellent. Okay. Now we have a question from online that, that Wayne is going to pose. I've received a remote question from Claire Good at Otago Polytechnic. And the question is, I think this is directed at David, um, is the Open Ranger something that the OERU could implement? Absolutely. Um, I think it's a, it's a great uh, friend network, uh, colleague and friend network that uh, works very diligently on our campuses as the go-to group for advocacy, for questions, for support, uh, for liaison with librarians and teaching and learning centers. They're kind of the glue that holds our network together. And we've invested quite a bit of time on them. In fact, this coming weekend, we're uh, uh, inviting uh, more open rangers another cadre of open rangers to come so they're emerging rangers that are going to be paired with our existing rangers to learn learn some of the skills and learn some of the uh, techniques and strategies that have been used on campuses to build community it's really about building community the open uh, the open community is people powered and we have to continue to invest in our people Thanks very much, David. I'm going to hand over now to Val. Hi, David. It's Val Peachy from Charles Sturd. It's great to have seen your presentation, and I wanted to ask you, you've accomplished an amazing amount in a really short period of time since you moved down to um, eCampus Ontario, and we've had those chats in BC. So my question is, how were you able to do this and establish that um, infrastructure in such a sh remarkably short period of time. And what kind of um, financial commitment did it take in order to do that? So we've had a very good support from our government um, in the open uh, space. They invested $1 million in 2017, which allowed us to build out the library and the open publishing infrastructure. And our operational funds are the funds that we've used to build the community supports. So we have a budget of about $15 million a year. And from that, we invest in people development uh, primarily. But we've also uh, advocated for uh, calls for proposals. And we've put lots of money into the system uh, for the development of new programs and courses. Uh, with the requirement that everything is openly licensed as part of the bargain. I'd also like to extend that question then out to our other panelists that um, as you are progressing with the different aims around open education at your own campuses, 
Um, are you finding that you're having to move very swiftly um, or is, is this something where you've got short, medium, long-term goals? I'd just be interested to hear more about your thinking at your institutions as to, as to how this is progressing and at what speed. So who would like to go first? Uh, thanks for that question. Um, the speed for innovation and OER in my context is, is at the gradual pace. Uh, the phase one is the advocacy and awareness of the philosophy and culture of OER and OERU and building that trust and the um, thinking that this can work if it has worked in other contexts. Uh, especially in developing countries. And this requires this culture shift and paradigm shift in unlearning practices that we have always done in open and distance learning. We're still in the distance world. The second phase is, is, taking, is, is learning from our partners or learning from success stories elsewhere and seeing what is applicable. So the first stage is planting the seed. And then the second stage is getting the uh, practices that have worked and trying to adopt, not in an overwhelming way, but in, in, in baby steps ways that we can sustain ourselves. And I think sustain, sustainability becomes a very important consideration for us in our context, where we can embrace an innovation practice that can work and can be sustained over time. And then the, the third uh, phase of it is the maturity stage where people are comfortable, people are trained, and they can take on the innovation further. I'll, I'll stop there for a while. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Oops, Steve. There we go. Um, yeah, thanks. I think it's, it's interesting to see. I think. Um, in many ways, I think no matter which institution you work at, if you look at your mission statements, your academic plans, your strategic plans, it's easy to identify and highlight language within those documents that supports open education work, whether it's access, whether it's student success, whether it's service uh, to community or anything else. And I think that's a really useful starting point. Um, I think at KPU, we've, we've had a lot of success because we've worked with all of our stakeholders on campus, uh, very proactively even. Um, so active partnerships with, for example, the registrar's office to be able to embed the flagging of courses that are, that are zero textbook costs because of OER in the timetable, or working with the bookstore to launch a print on demand service, or certainly with the library to launch, launch the open publishing suite. But the idea is that really trying to be able to provide, whether it's expertise or resources or anything else that people need uh, to be able to pursue their interest in this space, to be able to meet them where they are. Uh, certainly leveraging uh, early, uh, you know, identifying what would be the early wins, supporting them, celebrating them in a very public way, normalizing this within the culture of the institution. I mean, as a psychologist, I'll say that a lot of our language with open education advocacy is ought language. This is what we ought to be doing. And that's what I would call an injunctive norm. But persuasion is really powerful when you align injunctive with descriptive norms, which is this is what people are actually doing as well. And so aligning those is really important, saying this is what we should be doing, and these are concrete examples of your colleagues actually doing this and celebrating that. Uh, I think allowing people to see that it's not just that this kind of work is not going to be penalized, but it will be celebrated and supported, um, while at the same time framing it within academic freedom. Uh, I think uh, sort of a uh, the, one of the easiest ways to destroy an open ed education initiative within any context is to mandate it, is to, is to have it framed within uh, as a threat to academic freedom. Uh, and in this case, we're trying to frame it as more freedom, not less, more choice, uh, not less. Um, and a couple of other things. I think one is um, working externally as much as possible, because uh, it's often the case that we have champions within uh, you know, these early adopters, and you're talking about sort of diffusion of innovation, um, but not waiting until we reach that critical mass within our institution either. So, for example, we've done things like collaborative sprints, where we brought together 17 faculty from six different institutions in our province to create OER within a couple of days. Uh, and then, of course, creating the OER itself gives them skin in the game, which ends up uh, creating a community of adopters afterwards or actually creating active communities of faculty who are in the same discipline using the same textbook, using Hypothesis, one of the tools that Dave was talking about yesterday, uh, as a community of educators, to share the ways in which they're using the OER within their practice. 
Uh, so I think allowing people to feel not just supported, uh, but connected to their discipline in a way that normalizes this kind of practice uh, has uh, really encouraged a lot of practitioners to emerge. And for me, even though many people may come to things like open textbooks for the cost savings, it really has been the case that they stay for the pedagogy. And when they see that their approach in the classroom can be reinvigorated in that fashion, then it becomes less a question of how can I continue to provide small grants to faculty? Because now this is how they are approaching their teaching and learning. So for me, the sort of secret to the, to the success and, and the sustainability looking forward is on the one hand, uh, in collaboration within the institution and outside of the institution. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and really in, in a way that uh, builds capacity and celebrates that, that kind of uh, achievement. So. Excellent. Thank you. We've got another question from our online participants. Thanks, Adrian. Yes, we have a question from Lynn Hay, um, and she's uh, targeting this to David, but I'm sure the other panelists might want to comment as well. But the question is, how is open scholarship encouraged and supported by the Ontario eCampus initiative? Um, how are academics encouraged to print in, uh, or publish in open access journals? And um, how, is, how are these publications perceived as, uh, for academic promotion? So I'm sure Rajiv has talked about this earlier, but the University of British Columbia's move to, to make open education uh, as part of the tenure stream um, is, is a really bold move by a big uh, Canadian university. In our context, we have uh, open innovation calls for proposal in the past uh, that were publications and research that faculty conducted. And uh, our only requirement was that they be published openly. And in some cases that included paying for gold or green open or gold open access uh, in uh, scholarly journals that charged a fee. We have many faculty who uh, believe that uh, open access journals may not be the, the track for them right now. Uh, and so like our um, scholarly funding uh, councils in Canada, um, we have the requirement that you must publish the result openly, but we also allow you to use proceeds from the grant to pay for any kind of gold open access publishing so that the faculty member retains the copyright and is able to publish that work uh, almost immediately. So we've gone through a few of those with some of our larger research universities. Um, our only requirement is that it be published openly. Excellent, thanks very much, David. And I'll, I'll open that up to the, the other panelists as well, because I know that um, within Australian universities in particular, there has been quite a large push towards um, making sure that we are publishing in the, the, the highest quartile of journals um, and trying to really uh, m to lift what is perceived as the quality of research through the number of those articles. And often open access publishing um, comes in and it starts to be discussed on campus and the question becomes, well, is this recognized? Is this actually something that I can list when it comes time for promotion? All of these sorts of things. And uh, I'd just be very interested to hear uh, your take on these uh, at your institutions. So this time around, I might hand it over to Rajiv first. We'll go in reversal. Sure, I think, uh, of course, many of uh, you will realize that the open access movement is related, but not the same thing as the open education movement, although they certainly overlap. Um, and David's right in, in talking about the, the national policy in Canada, which requires that research that's federally funded has to be placed in an open repository within about 12 months or so. Um, but of course, more broadly, I think it's often the case that there's so much education that's required. There's just so many misconceptions when you're working with faculty in the area of open access scholarship. Uh, the confusion between open access publishing and predatory publishing is one unfortunate uh, pit that we have to keep revisiting. Uh, but the other is that there's only one way to do this. Uh, so I think educating faculty, not just about the national policy, but also helping them realize that it's actually to their advantage the open access citation advantage being a really good example of this. Uh, if the public can find full text copies of your work when they put, put in your, your name into Google Scholar, your work is going to be read. When your work is read, it is cited. And that makes a real difference when you, when you look at the impact of the work that you're trying to actually, uh, the impact that you're hoping for. 
So I think helping people at KPU, we have an open repository that we call Cora, working with our faculty to store whether it's preprints or anything else, whatever the journal policy allows. So even if they're publishing in closed paywall journals, they can still place, uh, let's say, preprints within the open repository uh, to disseminate their work further. So I think for faculty, it's often the case that when they reflect on the goals of scholarship, they realize that openness can support it, not in a way uh, that requires them always to publish in an open access journal either. And I think that sort of nuanced strategy of working with true open access journals where it's feasible, uh, working with preprints and open repositories where it's not, and in some cases, like it's David said, working with gold open access and actually paying those ridiculous article processing charges. Um, but really, I think the reflection is meeting faculty where they are and really demonstrating how openness is something that serves their own goals, whether it's impact in the field, whether it's uh, uh, readership or anything else. Excellent. I think for me, <clears throat> the biggest take here is um, just just promoting it, promoting it to faculty, promoting it to the educational, higher education space, and and making it available, making making funds available where academics and uh, practitioners in the open space can can access funding to be able to support them in in publishing in open access spaces. Yeah. Before, we, uh, before I open up the floor again, I just want to do a quick recap because as we've been going through, um, I, I did note very much that um, what we wanted to do was move the conversation beyond mere access, if you will. And so I've just been taking down some of the things that have been mentioned by all three of our panelists. And so far, we've got strategy, research, promotion, innovation, practice, context, scaling, meeting people where they're at, agency, advocacy, and funding. So already we are very much taking the conversation further than that. And so what I would like to do um, before we move um, on to some other questions is to ask that um, we've got some people who are in executive or senior leadership positions within the, the group here at the moment. And uh, I would actually like to hear from any of them about uh, the topics that we are discussing today. Things like how do you actually get traction for this at the institutional level? How do you actually support? Uh, do I have any takers to, to start us off? They said no. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you, Alan. I'll come up the front then people on the virtual participants can see me. Of course, we're all talking to the screen, but the camera's up there, so I'll, I'll wave at the participants from here. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Alan. For those of you out there, uh, I'm Alan Davis. I'm the president, vice chancellor at Quantum Polytechnic University, and Rajiv is uh, my colleague uh, and has done great things for us there. But I, my, while uh, David, in particular, was giving his presentation, um, I was wondering, of the 50,000 faculty in Ontario, how many actually are actively engaged in your initiative? And what intrigues me about eCampus e Ontario and also BC Campus, where you were before, David, is that you're a network within a network. And it would seem to me that there is lots that OERU as a network could learn from what you're trying to do in Ontario and build some of the capacities uh, in our platform that work for Ontario. So uh, hopefully there's going to be some sharing and synergy around that. Um, and also whether or not and this is kind of a Canadian thing, you know, because Ontario is the biggest province and you, you, you work in both English and French, both official languages. So there, it wouldn't be very difficult to take what you've created and make it a national initiative. It seems sad to me that Ontario is going to create a network and I think Alberta's got a network and BC's got a network. We're all stumbling over each other here. We read, it will be great to kind of uh, consolidate that and of course extend it to, um, some some global capacity as well so i'll just let you fire away at that david thank you well we do have a bit of a national network and rajiv is a part of it as much as uh, we are at eCampus and our colleagues between uh british columbia and ontario and out to the east coast of canada so we meet on a regular monthly basis so there is collaborative knowledge and sharing we share open textbook libraries we update each other's libraries with new publications as we put them together um, for every one open ranger or faculty member that we have 
um, affinity with in Ontario, they at least have at least 10 friends that they are bringing into their orbit as well. And so when we run events, they're always sold out. Uh, and in fact, they're not sold out, they're free, and they're always oversubscribed. So we have a lot of what we do is predicated on the notion of affirmative action. So Mark asked a question, have you found that institutions are less likely to collaborate than individuals at different institutions? Well, here's how we work. If you want to take funding from us to develop open resources or any kind of resources that end up being openly licensed, you have to collaborate with at least two other institutions to even make a proposal. So we're very much into affirmative action and that is uh, forcing the agenda um, realizing that collaboration and amortizing value expands with the more people who are involved in the enterprise. And that that's one of the other ways that we build community. And it's only when these people start working together, like three uh, colleges recently worked together to Canadianize a U.S. business textbook and make it a Canadian, uh, with Canadian case studies and Canadian cultural references, one of our institutions alone uses it with 2,000 students, saves their students 200,000 bucks a year. That's huge. We have saved $2 million this year alone for only 73 faculty adoptions. Now with close to 50,000 faculty in the province, we're only at the very tippy tip of that iceberg and we need to get better leverage and penetration. So there's tons of opportunity to collaborate across the country. There's lots of opportunity to collaborate across the province. That's not an issue, uh, and that's happening currently. The same is true in British Columbia. BC campus, Rajiv's been there as an open fellow, knows the power of that community spirit. And that's what we need to work towards. It's a human-powered enterprise, and we have to invest in the people who make it work. Excellent. I'll open it up to any other questions that we've got in the room at the moment before we go on to our online participants. Righto, did you have anybody else, Wayne, online? Because I know that you said that you were getting a small stock of questions there. Um, we, the, in, eventually from remote participant questions is building uh, slowly. We're progressing at academic speed. Um, but I have a question from Mark McGuire um, at Otago. And I think it's directed at David, but I'm sure other participants would be keen to respond. And the question is, have you found that institutions are less likely to collaborate than individuals at different institutions? In other words, do you work through institutions or individual academics? It's both. And um, it happens um, through our call for proposals and funding opportunities and expressions of interest that we announce. And I think I answered a little more on the last section, but we require collaboration in all of our projects. Now, I, um, I did have one, one question to extend that. So, for example, um, Janet, with, uh, with, your, um, with your institution, if, um, if another institution was very interested in partnering uh, with any of your academic staff, um, would you see this as a fairly easy thing to to achieve just on the uh, you know lecturer to lecturer, um, or just as easy institution to institution? Uh, where where would you start with that kind of collaboration? Thank you. <clears throat> I would start with that kind of collaboration from uh, an institution to an institution first and then coming down to the individual. Say for example, we have signed an MOU with Charles Sturt University, that's from an institutional perspective. And then from there, we can identify where the needs are. I think we've already identified where the needs are in terms of how can we make that become a reality? How can we make that work in our context and how can we also promote a win-win situation for both the institutions and the individuals involved? Say, for example, if there is an OER initiative, something that, that UPNG can offer to a partner, and at the same time where the partner can offer to us, uh, uh, starting from an institutional level, right down to the faculty, to the individual uh, academics, 
and to the learners, of course, if there could be an initiative like a call initiative, coil initiative for collaborative online um, interaction learning programs, something like that, or maybe capacity building in competencies in the open space, something like that. I think one of the uh, the very powerful things that you touched on there, Janet, was was that um, when when you are truly collaborating in the open space, um, it's actually about what what we can share together. And uh, as you were talking there about student learning, I mean, I, I was thinking to myself, well, it, it would be fantastic. And and this will lead into a question for you, Rajiv, is that when when you're looking at things like open assessment design, that wouldn't it be fantastic if we had an Australian university who was teaching, let's say, something around um, uh, business development, and then we had a similar course in Papua New Guinea, and we were able to get our students working together to say, well, what what are your um, contextual experiences? What are your what are your norms for for business development in Papua New Guinea? What are ours? How do we actually transfer that information between the, the two of us? And how do students actually learn from each other? And that's what I think is one of the really powerful parts of this. And I think that students. I'm very glad to hear that you mentioned um, students because a lot of the time even myself just then, I was just guilty of it saying institutions or faculty, and I completely left students out of the equation. So would you like to make a, a comment around that, around partnerships that involve students? Uh, from different universities. <laughs> it's funny, I feel like you're foreshadowing uh, the report back from some of the breakout groups earlier where we were talking about open boundary activities um, and potentially bringing together students who are enrolled in similar coursework at multiple uh, institutions. Uh, in a way that could involve open pedagogy even, uh, but otherwise have them interact uh, in, in a way that certainly benefits learning. Um, but yes, I think whether you're trying to foster collaborations uh, between students, uh, certainly between faculty, with whether you're talking about collaborative OER development projects or peer reviewing uh, OER as it's being developed at the different institutions, um, I think there's a, there's a tremendous emboldening that happens through this. Um, more and more institutions have, going back to Nerida's question, uh, an official designation, somebody who is an OER librarian. This is becoming more and more common. Uh, many institutions are developing campus um, uh, working groups for open education. And so it's often, uh, when you, in the question go, about institutions or individuals, it's often the particular people who have their pulse on what's happening within the institution. Uh, and it may not be uh, a senior executive, but it's likely the OER librarian or the campus working group that you reach out to, that the Canada OER group that has a monthly teleconference reaches out to. So when we're interested in developing something new, it's not just that we're sharing the cost, it's not just that we're making the work easier by sharing the workload, it's not just that we are maximizing the reuse potential of the work, uh, but we're really emboldening people to come forward and participate in something that would be really frightening for them to take on if they didn't have people uh, supporting them. Um, so yes. Excellent. Okay, we're starting to, uh, to come to the tail end of our hour at this point in time. So um, I know that we've got some more questions online. Uh, no more, okay, right, I'm, I'm getting the, the signal. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I think that uh, right now would be a good time for us to start to wrap this up. And as you can tell already, just from what is going on, um, throughout the uh, throughout the conversation is that we, we've really only just touched on the very tip of this and there's an awful lot that we can do to explore this in a much deeper way. The other thing that I was writing down was the kind of words that were being used and, and one of the things that fascinates me is the use of language um, that people have, especially when you look at the way in which open practitioners communicate the value of open. And so I just wanted to share with you some of the, the, the words that I heard uh, uh, repeatedly over the over the course of listening to our panelists, we had words like sharing, networks, colleagues, friends, support, hub, mentor, community, people development, stakeholders, partnerships, celebrating, collaborative, connected, and capacity. These are all words. None of these are words which say that we are going to do this by ourselves. 
every single one of those, I, I was starting to tick each time that that word got mentioned. And then I kind of ran out of steam because they, they were being used quite frequently. And I think that really that shows us that the strength of the network, the strength of something like the OERU lies in its people. And I, I wanted to, to close with a quote, uh, a quote from each one of the, uh, the panelists, something that I thought they said, which I thought was, was particularly inspiring. And this leads into David's quote, which I think absolutely brilliant. I'm going to, again, each time I speak with David, we get something which I threatened to emblazon on a very large poster. Um, and this time he said, innovative educators are the fuel of open. And I think that that's definitely something that, that it comes down to the people. Um, I, would also, um, I would also say that the focus that, that Rajiv brought, and one of the lines that I've heard him use a few times now, is that often people come for the savings, but stay for the pedagogy. I can see that somewhere. You know, if, if you want marketing, if you want marketing, um, come for the savings, stay for the pedagogy. And the other one that, that, that I heard um, that I think is a good challenge that has been laid at everybody's feet here by Janet is when she said that when we embrace openness, one of the challenges is to unlearn what we already think we know. And I think that there is no greater challenge for us at the moment. So I would like you to um, thank all of our panelists today and to thank uh, all of you as well for your participation. If you could put your hands together for our panelists, please. Now, I believe, Wayne, that we are going to be um, breaking now. No. Nope. Very well, and so we're just going to be switching rooms at the moment. Uh, my hopes for early lunch have been dashed. Um, <laughs> however, we're going to hear us back from some fantastic discussions. Um, I know the one that I was in uh, was was particularly inspiring, so I'm I'm definitely looking forward to hearing back from everyone. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Now we stop. Oh.